10, 9, 8, 7, Okay, let's go. No. <laughs> He's not responding. We can go. Okay. This is Mastering the Unlikable Character. Uh, so, before we begin... Uh, we're going to mostly talk about uh, defining them. Then we're going to look at the key uh, tactics and tools that I want you to take away to use. There's eight of them. Uh, we'll talk about reverse save the cat and a few first sentence patterns. And then you can ask me some questions at the end. All right. So when I talk about unlikable characters, there's obviously like a vast swathe of what that could mean. For this particular session, I'm talking about unlikable characters that are also protagonists. So I'm not really talking about a villain in the role of a villain. I might, however, be talking about a villain who's a protagonist. So who's seen uh, like the Joker movie with, I'm going to butcher the name, Joaquin Phoenix? That one. Who's seen that? Okay. Great. Who's seen Cruella? Perfect. Two examples of villains as protagonists. It's like a really popular uh, trend at the moment. Uh, so I also am talking about protagonists who are like morally grey, so like the bad boy in Roma, my favourites, uh, or the bad girl, obviously. Um, and we are also talking about major side characters who will have an arc. So obviously there's three types of side character, kind of cameos, minor ones that don't really have uh, character arcs, aren't in it too much, but just like a little bit. And then your major ones, I hate to use the example, but like Hermione and Ron. So like the ones that do have uh, depth, personality, and uh, a character arc. All right, now that we know who we're talking about, Let's uh, define it a little bit more. For me, there are different types of unlikable characters depending on the genre. It's a bit of a spectrum from like your seriously hard fantasy where you are going to have actual people who would like shank you in your sleep. Um, Anti-heroes come under this banner. Uh, and, you, you know, you're truly, truly Joker-like protagonists. Then we've got somewhere in the middle, like your romance, brooding, super hot people with muscles and tats and motorbikes. Um, uh, your love interests, your bad boys, the ones who are questionable in relationships. We've got a huge lot of, like, dark romance trends at the moment. Um, and so we're thinking about those kinds of protagonists. Um, and then you've got your softer fantasy, your kids' books, middle grade, where really it's more of like a grumpy bum than it is somebody who's going to stab you. Um, so these characters on that far end actually have a bit of a good heart, but they're like masquerading as a bad boy. Um, okay. Okay. So what this means on this spectrum is that there is a huge different range of disagreeableness. The um, villain protagonists don't change particularly unless they have like a redemption arc. So if you're writing a story with, I think, that's, uh, are you writing a redemption arc? Possibly? No? Val? No? 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 no. Okay. All right, so they don't particularly change unless they have a redemption arc. And they don't necessarily have positive endings. It's like the one kind of story that, you know, if you've got a villain for a protagonist, they don't have to have an HEA. Um, grumpy characters, though, so on the other end of the spectrum, like maybe your cosy fantasy, your kids' stories, they, they make a lot better decisions. They do change. They have more of an arc than your... Um, villain-esque type character. Anti-heroes don't change at their core. So anti-heroes will make a better decision, like Deadpool, for example, who makes uh, far better decisions about his girlfriend in the movie. Who's seen Deadpool? Excellent. Um, but remains a bit of an asshole still right to the end. And that's because the core of an anti-hero uh, can't change. His personality can't make him more morally white or better. He has to stay an anti-hero, other otherwise it's a flawed hero. It's a different type of character. And then again, um, brooding lovers, they will make a better romantic decision uh, and hopefully treat the uh, protagonist's love interest better as well. Um, but those that stick to their beliefs 
are the bad boy villain shanking protagonists um, and the anti-heroes, okay? So even if the anti-hero makes a better choice about like uh, does the right thing for the wrong reason or does the wrong thing for the right reason, um, their beliefs will stay the same. So their values, their uh, morals or like their, you know, Robin Hood, for example, still going to steal from the rich even at the end of the book and the movie. So the big problem with an unlikable protagonist is that they're unlikable. How do you get your reader to like, like them? Or if not like them, how do you get them to connect with them? I think there are eight different things that you can do to, to make this happen. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about now. Actually, no, we're not. I've totally lied to you. Um, we're going to talk about Save the Cat. Who knows what Save the Cat is? Excellent. Right, so I'm just going to read it out quickly for those on the uh, Zoomy Zoom. Uh, I, uh, this is what Blake Snyder says. This is a direct quote from the book. I call it the Save the Cat scene. They don't put it into movies anymore, and it's basic. It's the scene where we meet the hero, and the hero does something like saving a cat. Uh, that defines who he is and makes us, the audience, like him. But if you've got a nasty villain character as your protagonist, they're not going to do anything nice. So what the hell do you do? Well, um, I just made this up. Probably get in trouble with Blake if he was still here. Uh, but I call it a reverse save the cat. Um, and this is where, instead of the villain protagonist doing something good you do something really bad to them. And what that does is it elicits like a sympathy, empathy reaction in the reader. It's like a real nifty little trick because you end up feeling sorry for them. And that is the start of a connection. Even if it's not enough to kind of get over their behavior, it's enough to start that connection with the reader. So we've got some examples. So Deadpool, um, he scares the boy away in his mercenary job. That's like his like really bad negative behavior kind of defining uh, who he is. But he's actually uh, then told that he has terminal cancer. So even though he's doing something bad by scaring the shit out of this poor lad, um, he's then got terminal cancer and we're like, oh, okay, that's, you know, we feel sorry for him. Uh, nobody deserves that. And then in the Joker movie, uh, the Joker is beaten up right at the start of the film. He's like waving his sign around. He's desperately just trying to earn a buck and do his job. And they, like these teen hooligans, come and beat the crap out of him. Um, the, his is compounded because he's also living in a bad environment. His conditions are bad and everybody is just awful to him. But what this does is, even though we know that he's going to do some really awful things, because his situation is so bad, we connect with him because it almost, <laughs> I hate to say it, but it kind of justifies his behavior in the reader's fictional mind anyway. And then with Cruella, another example of uh, reverse save the cat is that she's, an, she's orphaned very early in the book. The dogs kill, in the book, in the film, the dogs kill her mum, and then she has to sleep rough. She has nothing. She escapes to London. So all these things make us uh, feel sorry for her, which is the start of our connection. Okay. So what then, how do you build on this? The first thing, if you have a villain, you're like, as a protagonist, you are then removing essentially that role that they were going to play as the villain. So who then becomes their villain? Well, this is the first thing that you need to do. Even if you've got a villain for a protagonist, you still need someone worse. So the villain needs a villain. Now, if I say villain any more times, I'm going to stumble over my words. Um, okay. So even if it's like a morally gray protagonist, whatever, you've got to have somebody that is worse than them. Um, and I suppose like often I will get asked like, does it have to be an actual person? Well, like no romance, you don't always have villains in like the embodied person type role. It can be intangible. The capital, for example, in the Hunger Games, is, although obviously that's a normal protagonist, but as a way of example, the capital represents like the villainness in the in the book. So that's an example of how you don't have to have it um, in a tangible person, but it helps. Okay, so what do the villains' villains need? 
all of the same stuff that a normal villain will need. So they need a solid motive, and it has to be more than just like the characters disliking each other. You've got to really like go deep into their um, context, their backstory. A really good example, one of my favorite villains ever is Agent Smith, and his kind of driving force for defeating uh, Neo is the fact that he wants his race to survive. Um, okay. The villain needs the villain's villain needs to be more powerful than the protagonist villain. So when you have a hero, one of the issues is that the hero doesn't have anything that or doesn't have all of the things that they need to beat the villain at the beginning of the book, right? We're waiting for them to get that final piece in the Dark Knight of the Soul. Well, this is the same for a villain protagonist, okay? So the villain needs to be more powerful than them. A really good example of seeing this is, uh, I don't know if anybody's read The Lies of Locke Lamour. I read it really recently. Textbook villain giving a choice to the hero. So Locke Lamora is a retelling of uh, Robin Hood. So he's a morally gray protagonist and his villain, this is a lot of villains, his villain then tells him at the end of the book, you can either save 600 people at the top of this building or you can go kill the guy that you really hate. So he's giving him an option A and an option B and any good hero, even if they're a morally gray hero, will find an option C. Okay, and then just like a normal villain, your villain's villain will need to drive the conflict. They'll need to cause problems, create issues, um, push your hero into like making mistakes and then eventually adapting as well. And then my favorite bit is the manifesto. I really think if you can write, I, I mean, it doesn't have to be a monologue, but their kind of ideology or their philosophy, if you can write it in a way that uses really extreme forms of logic, then nine times out of 10, you can get your reader to like invest in the villain's manifesto or I ideology for like two or three seconds. They'll question everything. The minute you do that, you win. You win the reader over. Um, and the best way to do that is to use really e extreme forms of logic, like Agent Smith um, presenting the argument that humans are a virus. And, you know, sometimes we are. Okay. Element two, narrative separation. So narrative separation is the intentional separation of character voice from narrator voice and, and opinion. And this is... Uh, varies and it is point of view dependent. So it's actually easier when you don't write in first person. Who writes in first person? Okay. Who writes in third person? Okay, you got it easier. Um, <laughs> so exceptions are uh, the book Thief, which writes in omniscient first person. Um, the, it, fantastic, fantastic book. Really worth going to see. Book Thief, we're going to see, going to read. The Book Thief also breaks the fourth wall. Um, so in first person, what you can do is to separate dialogue and action from thoughts and feelings. And I've got a diagram to show and explain what I mean by this. Um, but what you want to do is show a really stark difference between what the character is saying, how they're acting with the other characters, and then like their own internal thoughts and like that narration in the prose. So that's you, the author, letting the reader into the truth of the character. And that's where you buy the reader in and they feel like they're in on a secret or they are like closer to the villain protagonist in a way that the other characters are not. Um, yeah, and I guess like the big thing about this is the outward actions need to be negative. They need to be a bit of a dick. Um, but then they can either show remorse or they can at least like question their behaviors in um, like their narrative thoughts. I got a drink, I'm dry. This desert is dry. Okay. So this is kind of a diagram to explain what I mean by this. So let's hope this works. Your characters are all on the outside of uh, the protagonist, okay? So all these characters get access to are the dialogue and actions. So you can create one kind of opinion for them, and then you let the reader into everything that happens here. Um, and 
I think this is one of the best tools that you have at your disposal um, when you have a villain protagonist because you make the reader feel special and you make them feel included in a secret. And yeah, I just think this is magic. So this is my favorite tool. Oh yes, and this is the other point. You can use this to keep secrets from the other characters that the reader is then let into. And that's literally by using the protagonist narration to um, either confess secrets or you know, show that uh, ambiguity or them uh, questioning themselves. Okay. Key element three then. Whatever you describe in the prose, the reader's going to feel is important, which means you can manipulate them. Um, either you over-describe something where you are pointing the reader in a certain direction on purpose, and that can either be to distract them or to lead them down a certain path, or you can do the opposite and you can gloss over something. So when you've got a um, bad protagonist, you need to uh, justify their behavior or lessen it. Otherwise, if you, you know, you've, you, otherwise the reader may disengage from them. So you can gloss over something bad uh, by not giving the reader all of the details. So like, let's say they stabbed someone, uh, but you don't go into any detail about the description. It just sort of happened and you just kind of sweep it under the carpet. Um, you can also tell. I know we're always told not to tell, but occasionally it's okay. Um, and you can do this either in dialogue or in um, in, in like if you've got different points of view, you can use other characters to do it as well. Uh, so, oh, Clive, he never treated his customers right. Oh, Clive. Um, but again, even though I've said that and I've kind of stated that he's got bad behavior, I haven't actually described it, which makes it less bad than saying, Clive, massive wanker, stabs everybody that comes in the shop. <laughs> Not good. Um, okay. You can also, and you've got to be really careful with this, but you can make your protagonist unaware of the harm that they're doing. You do have to be careful because they can come across naive or disingenuous, but use a little bit, just a little bit. Uh, you can make them leave the situation before the impact or the consequence of their actions happen. That's one way. So then they're unaware without being like unaware because they'll know that something's going to come, but they won't see it. Um, but don't make them completely emotionally ignorant because that will disengage the reader. So this is a really fine line, this one. The other thing that you can do is aim their bad behaviors at other bad characters, right? So if you, if thematically, if you're, you know, exploring a dark concept and you've got lots of iterations of bad characters, then instead of your protagonist um, stabbing Clive, who's a really nice guy, I don't know if you've met him, um, you can then have him stab Bob, who's not nice. Um, and this will make his actions seem not as bad because whatever it is that Bob has done is even worse, right? Um, it's manipulation. And a good example, who's watched The um, Good Place? Okay, cool. So do you remember when Eleanor's roommate was doing the whole campaign with the dry cleaner or whatever it was? What it, yeah. So um, Eleanor... Um, I'm just going to read it because I can't remember the exact details. So Eleanor secretly starts an online public humiliation campaign targeting her roommate so that Eleanor can sell merch calling her roommate dress bitch. Um, this is a horrible thing to do. However, the roommate had just sued a small dry cleaning company into bankruptcy for supposedly ripping just one dress, which actually Eleanor ripped. But because the roommate is a bad person, we justify Eleanor's behavior. And we don't actually think it's that bad because, you know, roommate deserved it. I don't know who's got the moral grayness here, but I agree with Eleanor. Um, okay. Element four, limit the dislike factor. So we all know that even villains have mummies, right? Like they have to have some element of good in them. I'm not gonna go into that because I think we all know that. Um, but 
One other thing that you can do is limit how bad you're making them. So like with Robin Hood, he steals, but only from the rich. It's not like he's stealing from poor people and making the children starve. Um, or you could have like an example of Dexter. Who's watched Dexter? Yeah, it's one of my faves. So he kills people, but only bad ones that the police failed to get. So he is, A, justifying his behavior with a moral code, but also he's limiting uh, the amount of bad that he will do. Great tactic. Um, at, or f just for example, uh, you've got a character who's super selfish, but they're doing it because they're trying to care for a sick loved one, for example. So limit the bad behavior. Competency is element five. So we talked earlier on about uh, uh, your villain's villain needing to be more powerful than your villain protagonist. It goes further than that. You need to have some like quirk or behavior or skill that is that makes your uh, villain, your villain, your protagonist, your villain protagonist, villain super hyper competent. Like they need to be a master of whatever it is. And the reason that we need to do this is because competency breeds respect, right? If somebody is super good at something, oh, I, I nearly called out a really famous person who's super hyper intelligent but also a bit of a dick but I'm not going to do that because this is being recorded so just like think about you know stuff um like twitter um <laughs> oops oh I'm in trouble okay um the other thing to add to this is that if it's a really hard skill then the reader will respect the character even more. So the harder the skill is, uh, it does mean you're going to have to go down probably a rabbit hole of input to like make sure that you know what you're talking about. But the harder the skill, uh, the more believable it becomes. Uh, or you could flip this on its head, and rather than it being a skill, it could be a passion about something, some kind of topic, or, or um, yeah, or, or, or whatever. Because passion breeds connection with the reader. Excitement breeds connection. It's like, in fact, it's a virus, okay? Um, yeah. Element six is character, opinion, and a few little other tricks. So when your other characters have opinions about your protagonist, that will influence the reader and their opinion. So you could have another character have a really positive opinion uh, of your villain protagonist in spite of everything. So you, like the, a great example of a trope with this is like grumpy sunshine, right? So the grumpy character is usually the protagonist. The sunshine character like, is just vehemently positive about your uh, main character despite the fact that they're a complete ass, always moody, not very nice to the sunshine character and yet they persist with their positivity. Um, but what this does is it bends the reader's viewpoint and it will help to engage them, uh, their empathy and like kind of enjoyment of the protagonist. Um, and but they have to stick to their guns about their like for this character, like no matter what evidence is put in front of them. A really good example of this, uh, TJ Klune writes characters that are like Grumpy Sunshine. I can't remember if it was Under the Whispering Door. I think it was Under, under the Whispering Door, wasn't it? The, um, the, one who, the lawyer one. I'm going to go with Under the Whispering Door. We're just going like, to pretend that that's definitely the one. Um, okay. I think I've said all of that on the second one. Yeah, grumpy sunshine trope. Cool. I just had to read and double check, but yes. Okay. So, um, depending on your humor levels, the protagonist could also be like offended by this nice opinion. And this is what Wallace does in um, Under the Whispering Door. He gets deeply offended by this character who has a positive opinion of him, and like even more offended when the sunshine character tries to defend his bad behavior. So this is using like humor. You do have to be careful because obviously if you can't land the humor, it's not gonna, it's gonna it's going to have the opposite effect. But if you want to deconstruct a book that's super funny and does this well, I would recommend Under the Whispering Door. 
And then last but by no means least, you can have other characters like notice and draw attention to the fact that your character is changing. So in this book, uh, oh yeah, look, it was, winner, Under the Whispering Door by TJ Clune. Um, <laughs> it's like I know what I'm talking about. <sighs> I'm just tired of Kale. I just I forgot the name of the book. Um, okay, so Wallace is, is super grumpy, but the winning tool in any book is always the pet, right? Especially if it's a dog. Um, I actually personally prefer when the animals have like the ennui about humanity, like you know, that vampiric like exhaustion with humanity. Um, and the animals are usually like, oh, humans are just like shit. Um, we usually like that, but the, he uses the opposite tool here. So this dog is like the sunshine character, uh, but it's also symbolic because over the course of the book, even though the dog doesn't have any lines, he is like um, the the symbolism and the ch like the character arc change personified in his actions. Because the more that Wallace changes, the closer the dog gets to him. And of course, being the grumpy bastard that he was at the beginning, um, the, the, he's like a little bit mean to the dog, which is a really dangerous game to play because we all love the dog, right? Um, but then we see this persistent, cute dog um, trying to get him to like him, and he does over the course of the journey. And his character arc follows that exactly. It is like a masterpiece in s the symbolism of character change. Okay. Oh. All right, moral motivation. So whatever it is that is in their kind of manifesto or ideology, you've got to have some kind of logic for the protagonist that makes sense, right? So often you can either have a character do something bad, but for the right reason, or they can do something, right, do something bad for the right reason. They can do something wrong, but for the right reason. So Deadpool often does things wrong, but for the right reason, uh, just by way of example. You really have to iron out those justifications, and even if the protagonist is lying to themselves, they have to believe it, because if they believe it, the reader will believe it. And we as readers are obviously intelligent enough to know that the character's lying to themselves. Um, and so when, um, yeah, like when that, I don't know, I've got to backtrack. What was I saying? When, ah, I'm just gonna move on. Okay, so for example, if your character nitpicks everyone at work to the point of being anal, it should be because they believe in the, in the company's mission or delivering the best value to customers. And this comes from another example of um, Wallace, so Under the Whispering Door by TJ Clune. He's a lawyer and he is anally retentive about sticking to all of the rules, all of the bureaucracy, but it's because he wants to do a good job because he's competent and because he's an excellent lawyer. So this is like the culmination of everything that we've been talking about. And then another example is Agent Smith fully believes his methods are the best thing for both AI and the machines and for humanity. And he justifies that and because he justifies it using extreme logic, which we've talked about, we believe it for a few seconds, or at least I believed it for a few seconds. Okay. Okay, and number eight, character contrast. Spock and Kirk are a great example of this. When you have characters that are put into like that juxtaposition, it creates bigger imagery. It creates sharper contrast, which makes each character's personality even bigger. That's why we have tropes like grumpy sunshine, because the fact that they are so different draws um, like an even richer image for us. That's why we have like metaphors and similes. Um, Sherlock and Watson, another example. The other thing that you need to do though is to allow your characters to reflect on those differences. So, and this is where we are gonna go into depth from Under the Whispering Door. Let's fucking go. Okay, so we've got Wallace and Hugo. 
Wallace is the epitome of selfish. Um, and this is a quote from it. So they were alike in ways that Wallace hadn't expected. This is the reflection, right? Choosing a job and putting it above all other things. But that was where the comparisons ended. Perhaps when Wallace was young and bright-eyed, he'd started out with noble intentions. So it's character opinion, using character opinion to shape the reader's opinion. Um, but those had fallen by the wayside quickly, hadn't they? Always about the bottom line and what it meant for the firm, for Wallace. So obviously this is from right early on, beginning in the book, before he's gone through that change. Hugo um, is the uh, love interest in the story. And so he's the opposite side of the coin. And even if it's not like a romance, it's like a bromance or even just, you know, like a, you can do this with the villain and the hero or the villain's villain and the villain protagonist. Uh, or you can do it with an ally. Anyone in that close circle to the protagonist, you can use this tool with. Um, but having that yin yang is kind of important to highlight just how much of a grumpy bum the protagonist is. So Hugo then is the opposite of that and super selfish. Uh, and so this quote demonstrates that. I couldn't. I wouldn't have a normal life. Not like everyone else. The job would come first above all things. And this is a different job, by the way. This is a selfless role. Um, it was a commitment, one that if I agreed to would be binding for as long as I drew breath. Wallace didn't think Hugo would make the same choices he had. So Wallace is the grumpy protagonist, and that line is from later in the book where he is starting re to reflect on his poor behavior. And the fact that we have a character that is the opposite, showing all of the moral traits that the grumpy protagonist should be displaying helps him to reflect on himself because he becomes a mirror. Those yin-yangs are mirrors to each other. Um, so yeah, make sure you put that reflection in your prose. Okay, first sentence characterization. Um, I, if you get a chance to go back and listen to the other session I did this morning, I talk about deconstruction in a lot more detail. Um, and one thing that you will find is that there are lots and lots of patterns uh, with these particular types of characters. So I always say that when you see something occur twice, it's a connection. But when you see it occur three times, it's then a pattern. If it, if it becomes a pattern, you need to pay attention to it. It's an expectation that your readers will have. And it's probably something that the genre, um, that either defines the genre, the trope, or uh, like something that the market wants. Therefore, you should probably put it in the book. So um, here we have three examples of first lines. The first one is from Under the Whispering Door. And it goes, Patricia was crying. Wallace Pryor hated it when people cried. S and then we have A Master of Gin by P. Jelly Clark. I hope that's how you pronounce it. And I'm going to compare them in a second. So Archibald James Portendorf disliked stairs with their ludicrous lengths ever leading up as if in some jest. So the comparison here is that you're... <coughs> Your grumpy protagonist, my throat is going, hold on. Your grumpy protagonist, I sound like a teenage boy um, with my voice breaking. Your grumpy protagonist has to be grumpy right from the outset. The thing about these villain protagonists is they're unexpected. And so when you're having a character that's so intensely unexpected, you have to tell the reader this. You have to demonstrate this super early on so that you don't disengage the reader. And so if you go and look at books that have um, grumpy protagonists, you will find that maybe not always the first line, but definitely on that first page, you will see that represented. What they do here is they hate on something completely normal, something that is um, not, uh, uh, what's the word? It, it, it's completely, uh, no normal person would find this dis disagreeable, right? So stairs, for example. I mean, like, sure, my thighs don't particularly like stairs, but, like, I'm not going to bitch about it. Um, and crying. Most normal character, most normal people would, you know, give someone a tissue at the very least, even if you don't have empathy, right? You're not going to hate on somebody for crying. So... It's subverting the expectation of what a nice person would do. And we're putting it right in that first sentence. 
And then, I mean, the, the third example, if you are interested in stories with happy endings, you would be better off reading some other book. So that was from The, uh, the Bad Beginning, a series of unfortunate events by Lemony Snicket. Not quite the same. It's not necessarily hating on anything, like inane on, that was the word, inane on, in, in that first sentence. But he is demonstrating his... Um, intolerance for anything, including you, the reader, right? So you're setting up that expectation. Um, so yeah, make sure that you do do that on the first page so that the reader doesn't get a chapter in and then go, wait, what? Like, how am I supposed to connect with this character? Okay, I think... So this is just like a quick list of all of the key uh, bits. And I think that brings us to the end if we've got questions, a little bit under. Any questions? Hi. Or do like they get shit on for doing the exact same things <laughs> as male characters tend to do, and I'm sure anyone here who writes romance knows what I'm talking about. What is your advice for that? I mean, I... Other than er eradicating misogyny, but I know that's... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> down with the patriarchy. Sorry, everyone. It's like 50% of the people walk out. Um, <sighs> competency is a really important factor for, yeah. like, having a female who's going to be super bullshy. The other thing is, like, to be unapologetic. So I write really angry women, um, but... It, that narrative separation is a super tool for you because you can have their external actions like outward facing the rage, the um, you know murderous tendencies, but then it's how you justify that in the narrative separation. Like, what is your character's in, inner thoughts? How, what are their values? How are they either justifying it or um, feeling guilty? Or, you know, it's that emotional side that you're only giving to the reader. If you can keep that just for the reader, then they will connect because it's that authenticity aspect that only they're getting and the other characters aren't. So you can keep like the villainous side outwards and, and connect to the reader that way. Hello. So mm -hmm. my question is, is there a secret formula for creating characters that we love to hate? If you think about the likes of Joffrey from Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. he has none of the redeeming qualities or a lot of these things here but he's someone that we love to hate. There will be a formula. Have I deconstructed it right now? No, but I could. Um, I'm just trying to think. I mean, comeuppance is a really important one. Mm -hmm. um, you have to... You have to give them a justified en ending. Usually it's something that you've threaded in. So some kind of... Um, like ironic ending for them, like the very thing that they didn't want is their ending. Um, that really helps. Um, I would have to deconstruct, I think. The best thing that I would do is read like two or three books where you've got those characters that you love to hate and then do a comparison and see like where those patterns are, like what do all three books do, or even all three movies. If you want to do it quickly, do it with movies. Um, yeah, I can't think off the top of my head without doing the deconstruction. That's perfect, thank you. <laughs> I was interested on your take on like corruption arcs and how a character like can go from likable to being unlikable, like how you kind of seamlessly like transition that. <sighs> um, slowly, um, and you know, with with a wound and whatever that manifests outwardly. Like at the e that when a character, oh my God, I'm really struggling to speak because I'm so tired. When a, when a character is bad at the beginning, right? It's the culmination of a multitude of events. It's not just like one failed test as a teenager. It's a multitude, it's a failed test. It's somebody dumping them. It's them getting fired from a job, right? That's what psychologically creates the trauma. It's repeated exposure. And so if you're going to do a corruption arc, it can't just be one thing because we're stronger than that as people, therefore your protagonist is stronger than that. So you have to make sure that you've got repeated uh, traumas to them in the book and try and make them different each time 
even though they're attacking the same wound. So like thematically, when you've got like say a cast of five characters, they should all kind of represent the theme in a different way. Um, you want the wounds or whatever um, traumas that are happening to that character to create the corruption to do that too. So like do it different iterations on the theme is what I would say. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Hi. Um, what advice would you give for if, say I had a vision of a character who is just really terrible and I want them to, um, I want to twist it so that a reader would somehow like them and I just can't picture how because they are just so terrible. Do you have advice of a... Show humanity. So, uh, I really, forgive me for using Harry Potter, but Voldemort, for example, doesn't really have any redeeming qualities, but what he does do is he shows humanity to Nagini, the snake. Um, so he's showing some kind of affection or uh, valuing something that isn't himself um, that, that has some kind of humanity. So even though the snake isn't embodied in a person, it connects to us because it's a living, breathing thing. So if you can uh, maybe show a kindness to something that's unexpected, um, that they value a person, a thing, a memory, an experience, um, that will help. Hello. Hello. When writing a series, um, how soon does the manifesto need to be made known to the reader? There are no rules. Okay. That I was easy. To hold off, so. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a Facebook question. Okay. Uh, this is from uh, Terry Tatiana. I hope I'm getting that name right. Uh, the question is How do you make a promiscuous female protag connect with an audience that might view this trait as immediately bad? In other words, how does she become likable despite this socially, morally gray trait? I don't think being promiscuous is morally grey, one. Um, <laughs> who doesn't love sex? Come on. Um, but, but also, like, that is the point, right? What I've just said is how you do that. You make that character love whatever it is that their trait is. They, they are proud of it. They un remove the shame. That's how you do it. If they don't carry any shame over that behavior, then we won't read shame, and therefore we won't um, see it as a bad thing. Amen. We've got a follow-up. Okay. This is from uh, Kina Shaw-Reed. She says, what about cheating redemption? Is it, if the spouse knows, accepts, or forgives, uh, how can the reader? Oh, I don't know how to answer that because I haven't written cheating. Um, I don't know. Honest answer, I'm not sure. I would read books where cheating happens and deconstruct, um, deconstruct the justifications, the other character opinions... Um, and deconstruct the dialogue between the two characters and also the pacing of the forgiveness. That is what I would tell you to do. Thirty-nine seconds. <laughs> also, hold your peace. All right then. 